murder, the unlawful killing of another living, breathing human being, or, as was the case on April 19, 1995, on a cool, crisp spring morning in downtown Oklahoma City, 168 living, breathing human beings. On this season of A Murderous Design, we'll study what may be the largest circumstantial evidence trial ever heard in an American courtroom, the United States of America versus Timothy James McVeigh. Based on the authentic trial transcripts and interviews with those who tried the case, we will uncover the author responsible for the formation and execution of A Murderous Design. I'm Brandon Birmingham. This is Timothy James McVeigh versus the USA. Stephen Jones led Timothy McVeigh's defense. He assembled the team of lawyers and experts and put on some 30 witnesses, including the cross-examinations of Eldon Elliott and Michael Fortier. He has written numerous law review articles about his experience in defending one of the most hated men in America and wrote a fascinating book about the whole case, not just this trial, but the entire investigation, called Others Unknown. He sat down with me twice, thankfully giving me his thoughts on the case, including the ingenious way that he viewed McVeigh's defense. Please welcome Mr. Stephen Jones to A Murderous Design. My name is Stephen Jones. I'm a lawyer in Oklahoma. I live in Enid, Oklahoma, and I practiced law for 53 years. I went to the University of Texas as an undergraduate and OU for law school. And uh, back in 1995, you got a phone call to be uh, involved on a pretty big case, uh, Timothy McVeigh. Tell me about how you became involved in that case. Um, <clears throat> the... Um, on on the night of May 5th, which uh, coincidentally happened to be the 26th anniversary of my returning to Enid, um, I had received a telephone call earlier in the day from Chief Judge David Russell, who at that time was the Chief Judge of the uh, United States District Court for the Western District of Oklahoma, which uh, sat in Oklahoma City, and that was the seat of the court. And I had been out of my office that day, so he left a message for me to return the call. And uh, when I came back to the office about six o'clock, I attempted to return the call, but I got a recording, a voicemail. And so I left my home number, and at about 10 o'clock, the phone rang, and I was on the way downstairs. Um, and the lights hadn't been turned on, but I knew the way to the library. So I went in and uh, picked up the phone, uh, and it was Judge Russell. Uh, and after a brief uh, preliminary introduction, he uh, said, well, I guess you know why I'm calling you. And I said, uh, I have no idea why you're calling me, but I reached for a legal pad. And he said, well, then I will come straight to the point. We've had a meeting down here, myself and some of the other judges or the other judges, and we have a question to ask you. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, "Uh, the question is, uh, if asked, would you agree to accept an appointment as the attorney for an individual who has been charged or will be charged in the Oklahoma City bombing? And I thought the way he uh, phrased the question, at that time only Tim McVeigh had been arrested, but he clearly anticipated that others might be. And um, so I responded, I said, well, I don't have a professional problem with it. I understand what you're trying to do. And certainly I've been involved in controversial cases, but I've never been in one, involved in one in which I thought my wife or my children or home or Uh, associates or even the building where we practice law could be at risk. And I think in fairness, I should uh, get their opinion. And uh, he said, well, how long will that take? And I said, 24 hours. So he sort of then diverted the conversation and, and we talked about other matters for about 20 minutes. And while he never specifically said I would be appointed to represent uh, Mr. McVeigh, uh, that clearly was the drift of, of where he was going. And 
I didn't intrude on his thought process. I asked probably some practical questions such as uh, if I'm appointed, how will I be compensated? How much time will it take, et cetera, just kind of spur of the moment. And um, he answered those questions. And so then at the end of about 20 minutes, uh, the call ended and I sat in the library alone for maybe an hour and my wife came in she'd been out for the evening and our children were in college and um, when she came in I called out to her I said to Jonesy would you come in the library and she came in and immediately noticed all the lights were off and she asked why the lights were out and I referred to her by another nickname Raider I said Raider the um, the call that you feared would come has come And by that, I meant Cheryl had a premonition, which she had shared with me in the uh, two weeks or so, three weeks since the bombing, that I would be called and that I would be asked to defend him. I didn't believe that. And I told her, no, no, that's not how the system works. I'm not even on the panel. And she was adamant. She said, I, they will call you. So you might as well be ready. So, and she was right. I was wrong, not for the first time in the 47 years we've been married. Um, She said, what are you going to do? And I said, well, we're going to discuss it as husband and wife and call the children and decide. So we did. And the next day I called uh, about a dozen people whose judgment I well respected and have been clients or friends involved in politics or the law to get their view. And last person I spoke with was Governor Keating. I was um, Frank and Kathy Keating's um, special counsel and um, represented them in various matters. And I thought it was appropriate to discuss it with him. But uh, I called the judge. He told me to call him back at 630, which was 21 hours, not 24 (laughs) <laughs> and I called him at 6.30, and he answered the phone. I repeated the question to him formally, and I said, uh, the answer is yes. And he sort of let out a sigh like he was some imaginary or real burden had been lifted, and he said, great, I appoint you as lead defense counsel for Timothy James McVeigh, be in my chambers at 1.30 Monday, ready to go to work. I was grateful to him that I had the weekend to think about it. Um, and when I say to think about it, to, to do in my mind what I would do and how I would go about it. And uh, so Monday at 1.30, I went to his chambers and, and um, with my daughter and a couple of my associates. And it was a kind of a small ceremony in his uh, protocol in his chambers and then he asked everyone to leave except me. And he went over and closed the door and he'd taken off his robe. And he was in his shirt sleeves. And I stood up and uh, he said, stick, stuck his hand out to shake mine. And he said, well, Stephen, I hope I haven't signed your death warrant. And I said, well, David, first time I'd used his Christian name since he'd been appointed. I can assure you that makes two of us. And uh, he smiled. He said, well, the the marshal's ready to take you to meet your new client. So I drove out with the marshal to the prison and met Timothy McVeigh. And and next two and a half years, that was all I did. Let me ask you, before we go to that that first meeting with McVeigh, this was a, the way you describe it was a decision where you're considering a lot of other people, you know, the people that you practice with, obviously your family, your wife, but I mean, just you personally as a lawyer, your, I mean, your practice is in Oklahoma. You are, I don't know if you were born there, but I mean, this is where you've lived your whole life pretty much, right? And how was it to take on this case in this climate um, at that time for you personally? Well, um, you're, you're right. I lived in Oklahoma. Um, I've been active in politics. Uh, I think at that time I'd represented three of the, well, I guess we'd only had three Republican governors. Um, I've been the nominee for the United States Senate. I'd worked for Richard Nixon uh, when he wasn't president. I was his personal research assistant. I'd worked in Washington for congressmen and senators, and I had an active practice of law. Uh, So, and I practiced law for uh, 25 or 27 years. 
uh, including federal criminal cases and ironically one previous bombing case of the federal building. Um, so I, I, I thought I was prepared. I, I mean, I felt that in terms of maturity, I was 50, 54 years old. I'd practiced for, as I said, a quarter of a century in trial work. I'd been a special United States attorney and special prosecutor for the state of Oklahoma. And I defended probably two dozen first degree murder cases. And most of those were death penalty cases. Um, so in terms of experience and knowledge of the rules, I was immodest enough to think that I could do it, was prepared for it. I don't think that I understood that there would be so much interest in the defense. Uh, the judge told me there would be, uh, and I sincerely thought he was over-dramatizing it. He said, well, CNN's going to follow you now until this is all over with daily. And I said, well, I can't imagine they're that much interested in me. I'm sure they're interested in Mr. McVeigh and the victims and the circumstances. But as far as me personally, I, uh, I can't see that. Well, I was absolutely wrong and he was right. Um, I mean, the day he announced it or filed the order at 3.30 and by 4.30, I had my first call from the Today Show if I could be on the following morning. And after that, it, it, it never let up. Um, in terms of personally, um, I had a lot of controversial cases. Oklahoma then, and still is, a very conservative state. It was a conservative Democrat and then became very conservative Republican. I was active in the Republican Party. And so I didn't have any illusions about how it might be received in Oklahoma. But I had been involved in so many controversial cases and, and, and those not only uh, murder, mass murder cases, but politically hot cases like Vietnam war protesters and, and uh, the gay movement in the early days and civil rights and civil liberties cases, the prison reform case. So controversy was not new to me. Um, and for whatever reason, I, I didn't think immediately there would be any potential threat to me or my home. I, I thought about it that night, but as I got involved in the, in the case, that kind of receded uh, into the background. Um, and I lived in a small town, uh, small in the sense of 50,000 people. So I, I, honestly, I didn't give much thought to that. I just thought about, well, who's going to help me? What do we do? What's our first move? And there were so many decisions, uh, Judge, that had to be made almost immediately uh, that I just didn't have time to think about that. So you go to meet for him, meet him for the very first time. Yes. Uh, it was probably one of the very first things you did, I would imagine. Tell me about that. Well, <clears throat> um, I drove out, uh, Mr. McVeigh had been, he'd made his initial appearance at Tinker Air Force Base after he'd been arrested in Perry because that was a secure facility. And in fact, that's where the grand jury met, which indicted him, except for a couple of meetings in Oklahoma City. Um, so I went to uh, El Reno, which is uh, 30 miles west of Oklahoma City, which is a medium security facility. And they were expecting me. And uh, I walked down long hallway with the warden and uh, the marshal. And then we made a kind of a sharp turn to the right and opened a door. And I recognized Mr. McVeigh immediately, although he looked much different than the walkout at Noble County Courthouse. The, the, the difference could not have been more striking. Um, and I walked over to him, he stood up and uh, I said, Mr. McVeigh, my name is Stephen Jones. I'm a lawyer from Enid, Oklahoma, and I've been appointed to represent you. And he stuck out his hand. He said, well, I heard you were coming. And then the marshal and the warden and the others started to leave the room. And I'm sure they heard me as I asked him to sit down. I said, uh, uh, why don't you take a few minutes and tell me about yourself? So we talked about 20 minutes. And um, I said, I'll be back tomorrow and we'll spend the day working. And so we shook hands and, and left. And, and um, then the next day I toured the 
building, it was still standing. And the aroma and ambience of death was, was clearly uh, there. And then I went to the prison about uh, 10 a.m. And I said, uh, I'm sure I had lunch. I'm sure I went to the restroom. I had something to drink. I don't remember any of that. I only remember sitting down. I had a yellow legal pad. I didn't take a single note. And I just asked him to begin where he wanted to begin. And so I sat there, my memory is, for 12 hours at 10 p.m. When I was conscious of how much uh, time had passed, I said, well, somebody will be back tomorrow. And so I went down the hall to the canteen where the guards had their lockers and, and um, Coke machines and pay phones. Uh, and um, as I went in, there was a television set up on the, near the ceiling. And I could tell that across the street, there was a crew from Channel 9. And um, uh, I've forgotten the reporter's name now, Joe Reynolds. She was reporting. And it was clear to me that the camera was focused where I was. So if I'd walked over to the window and looked out, I would have seen myself on the television screen. And I remember uh, Jan said, um, behind me is the El Reno Federal uh, Prison where uh, Tim McVeigh's court appointed lawyer, Stephen Jones, has spent the day with him. We can only imagine what they're talking about. And I felt said to myself, oh, if you only knew. Um, so then I left uh, and went to my hotel in Oklahoma City. Uh, for security reasons, the hotel I went in, I exited, there was a car waiting for me and I went to another hotel. Uh, the hotel was bathed in lights and uh, there must have been about a hundred reporters outside. I'd anticipated that, so I moved to another hotel by prearrangement. But as I sat there, he told me everything that he thought I wanted to hear. I didn't attempt to direct the conversation, but I remember listening. And as he was describing certain moments, my mental picture was victims falling through the air as the floors of the building buckled and they were buried down underneath the rubble. Um, and then uh, the next morning, I think we had a meeting in my office and with the people that I preliminary selected and we started to work. So by this time you had had a, a team uh, and you had a massive amount of, I mean, of information that you had to deal with over the course of the next, you know, well, the life of the case really. Um, first of all, how did you pick your team and did you, were you able to pick your team? How did you pick your team? And then how did you tackle this massive amount of, of information? Well, at that time, I had, I believe, six lawyers working for me. So I used them. That, that was the nucleus. Uh, and um, then I contacted Bob, I'm sorry, Rob Nye, who had worked for me, who was uh, the federal public defender in Lincoln, uh, Nebraska. And we arranged to meet in um, Junction City, Kansas, or I'm sorry, Salina, Kansas, at a Holiday Inn that Sunday, my, my son, one of my sons was at St. John's Military School. And I asked Rob to come in as sort of the second in command. We had worked together very well and, and I thought it was important to have someone that had experience with the federal defender system. Um, the judge had suggested that I add someone and he named it and he told me why he, he was basically asking me as a favor if I would do it. I was reluctant to do it, but I knew Judge Russell. Uh, we'd been in law school together. We'd been in politics together. Um, I, I agreed. That was a mistake. Um, but beside that, within two weeks, that particular lawyer told me that um, he could not work on the case. Uh, on guilt innocence. And um, I said, well, I take it you're against the death penalty. And he said, yes. I said, in all circumstances. And he said, yes. And I said, well, then why don't you head up team two, the 
the sentencing portion. So I made that decision. He stayed on, on the team and he did a, a very competent job in that. Um, but it was not a good fix. Um, I didn't know him and he didn't know me. Um, the others I hired uh, or brought in simply because I knew them or had some experience with them. They had worked for me before and they all joined in. Uh, so at the end of it, we probably had a total of 17 lawyers, counting a firm of solicitors in London. Um, that's kind of a uh, an overstatement because some of those lawyers worked for Sam Guyverson, who was our electronics man. So probably directly working on the team um, and not support, I would say was probably 10 or 11. And then we had uh, the secretaries on the staff and I brought in some extra investigators. So we, we were up and running within 30 days. How did you divide up the workload? Um, I mean, you, you talked to me before about the, 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 the way that you looked at this case, which I thought was fascinating. Uh, you had different legs of a table. You've compared it to legs of a table before. And if you knocked out a couple, it would wobble. If you knocked out some more, then you might avoid the death penalty. If you knocked out some more, you might win the case altogether. Uh, talk to me about that. Well, the, the first thing I did that weekend was I uh, had a copy of that wonderful book by, I believe, John Kaplan called The Trial of Jack Ruby which to me is a manual of how not to defend a controversial murder case. So I read the book uh, and annotated it of all the things that to avoid. And it was a wonderful introduction. And in the process of, of reading it and thinking that weekend, it occurred to me that it was best to approach this assignment uh, legally and factually to, to have a level playing field legally, we had to accomplish 10 to 11 important objectives. Um, and, and those were first getting a change of venue out of Oklahoma, uh, getting a judge out of Oklahoma, getting adequate money to finance the defense, uh, separating ourselves from Terry Nichols and avoiding a joint trial, granting a severance. Um, there were certain pieces of evidence that we wanted to try to suppress. Uh, and so when I, um, I prepared later when I would give talks to law schools called strategic considerations for the defense of the McVeigh case. And I wrote legal objectives to be achieved to secure a fair trial. And there were seven of them. We achieved all of them. Recusal of any Oklahoma federal judge change of venue from Oklahoma, adequate financing for the defense, severance of the trial from Terry Nichols, uh, preclusion of statements made by Terry Nichols from being used against Tim McVeigh in either a joint or separate trial, uh, adequate time to prepare the defense, and comprehensive pretrial discovery. We achieved all of those. Um, the the so-called media talking heads, legal heads, who were lawyers in Oklahoma City, almost routinely, they said there was no chance of our getting a change of venue or changing the judge. They were all wrong. Um, the, the, the first was to recuse the judges. And I had a, a, a I don't want to take too much time on one point because you have a lot of points to cover, but we had uh, in the earlier bombing case that I mentioned, which was in the 70s and, and the bomb fizzled, but all of the judges in Oklahoma federal court uh, in the Western, Western district had signed a recusal. And I'd represented that woman and I still had a copy of the recusal. So perhaps unfairly, I used their recusal of the earlier bombing case, which was non-controversial to get uh, them removed in the McVeigh case. And uh, Judge Alley, who was appointed, uh, resisted it and uh, properly so. He appointed a lawyer to argue the merits of his order declining uh, to recuse himself. The Tenth Circuit granted the writ of, of uh, prohibition. And uh, Stephanie Seymour, the chief judge of the Tenth Circuit, appointed Richard Mage, which was a godsend for us in all ways. Um, with Judge Mage, 
we were then fairly confident we would get a change of venue. Um, I didn't know that he would be bold enough to move the case to Denver where he was the chief judge, but it made sense because there was a federal prison outside Denver. He controlled the courthouse. He wouldn't be a visiting judge. So and he would control the marshal and, and uh, he had a special courtroom constructed for the trial. And it, in all ways, it was extremely convenient for us. Although we were the last to move to Denver, everyone else moved fairly quickly. I kept us in Oklahoma. Um, probably the most significant, at least at the time, was granting the severance. The government bitterly resisted that. Um, I shouldn't say bitterly, they, they strenuously resisted it. Um, and it was um, uh, an interesting day of debate and argument and evidence uh, but in the final analysis, Judge Mach granted the severance, and the government elected to try us first, which was no surprise. Uh, but we had clear legal objectives that we felt we had to have those before any jury was impaneled. We were able to get those, so we were fairly confident that with Judge Mach we would have a fair trial. That was before the Dallas Morning News story. Um, after we sort of made that priority and that planning, um, I then thought about the government's case and we didn't get any discovery until January of 1996, which was since the trial, I mean, the bombing occurred in April, um, three quarters of a year later, uh, that was a real turning point for us, um, but after we began to, to receive it, and I, I was on my way to London when I received it, and I read it overnight on the plane, and I remember being excited and calling back to the office and telling them, we have a defense here. We can win this case. It seemed to me, and that's the second part of, of um, what I call the organization of uh, the McVeigh defense, and when I put this together, I thought at the time as I, there were six elements of the government case. One, location of Tim McVeigh when arrested. Two, the contents of Timothy McVeigh's political writings and political opinions. Three, the Daryl Bridges debit long distance telephone card. Four, eyewitness identification. Five, the FBI forensic laboratory. And six, the testimony of Michael and Lori Fortier. So I visualized that as a table with six legs and each of these six elements were legs. And obviously the first two, uh, we couldn't challenge factually. I mean, he was where he was when he was arrested and they did find the material in his car. Uh, we could offer a different explanation than the government's theory and we did, um, but we simply divided it into a teams uh, and, and the teams were not referenced to the legs, the teams, or which is the second page, the organization of the McVeigh defense. And there were six teams, one, the lead defense attorney, which was me, two, the deputy defense uh, counsel or second in command, which was Rob, <laughs> pardon me. Then team one was preparation for the defense of the guilt innocence stage of the trial. Rob was a team leader. Two, preparation for stage two, the punishment or sentence phase, and Dick Burr was the team leader. Three was evidence control, recording, receipt, and examination, including analysis of FBI laboratory forensic files. Bob White was a team leader. Team four was the management and administration of the defense, which was Michael Roberts. Team five was legal counsel to the defense, which was Randy Coyne, who taught at OU. And then eight, or I'm sorry, six was litigation support, which was basically Sam Guyverson. So um, that's, we, we integrated the six legs of the table with the team. Um, there were meetings every day and every day that I was Tim McVeigh's lawyer, somebody from the defense team met with him, even on Christmas day. Thanksgiving Day, whatever it was, there was always someone with him. 
of those uh, six components of the state of the, I call it the state. I, I didn't see. I've never been a federal practitioner of the of the government's case. Uh, the location of the defendant, his his the stuff that he had on him. Um, you talked a little bit about that. Which of those other four, the Bridges calling card, the eyewitness testimony, the forensic evidence, I guess the FBI lab and the testimony of the 40As, which of those four were you most concerned about if there was one? Actually, I was concerned about all of them, but I thought that some of them were weaker than others. Um, The one that we were most successful in defeating was eyewitness identification. Uh, The government produced no witness on the stand that could testify as to Tim McVeigh's presence or whereabouts from the early morning hours of uh, Wednesday, I think the bomb went off on a Wednesday, until his arrest. So there was a period of basically um, 24 hours that they didn't have a witness. They had witnesses. Lots of them. The problem with the witnesses from the government standpoint is they all claim to have seen one other person with Tim McVeigh. So they made the decision not to call any eyewitnesses because they knew where that would take them and what we would do. So I would say we were most successful on that. The second that we probably were successful uh, to some degree, certainly in the sense that it caused the government to completely change their line of prosecution was the FBI laboratory. I I couldn't help but think that J. Edgar Hoover must be rolling over in his grave, that here was the, at that time, the greatest mass murder case, greatest investigation the FBI had uh, in, in comparing it to Judge Wood's assassination investigation and the Kennedy assassinations. And the FBI's forensic expert could not testify. They had to use a woman from the Ministry of Defense in the United Kingdom Um, because the whistleblower, the the one person in the FBI lab that was trained in trace analysis, uh, Dr. Frederick Whitehurst, the only PhD uh, in the FBI laboratory, was a whistleblower and had condemned the techniques and tactics used by the FBI laboratory, which then led to the inspector general's investigation which then led to the report. So the government made a strategic decision, which I did not see at the time. It was a brilliant move on their part, very skillful. They elected to try an emotional case. And by an emotional case, I mean a case centered on victims. They knew, certainly before the Dallas Morning News story, now once that happened, then I think the government became more confident. But I believe, well, in fact, I know that the government was very concerned about whether they could convict Timothy McVeigh because it was a circumstantial case. Um, It was really easier to convict Terry Nichols, even though the government had a problem doing that because they, they sort of created Terry's defense in the way they handled it. But, uh, McVeigh was different. They, they didn't have an admission against interest. They had his sister's testimony. But uh, he, in contrast, uh, he had served his country honorably, had an honorable discharge, had the Bronze Star for service, had two Army upgrades for valor. Um, and he certainly gave a good appearance in the courtroom. So the government used that Noble County walkout. I, I'm sure that must have been shown 30,000 times. Um, but then they had decision quest of California, the, the jury consulting firm and decision quest is absolutely one of the best in the business. I couldn't use Robert Bennett in Dallas, um, because he was associated with Mike Tyker and I called Bob and, but he said, you know, Mike always had first call on him. So I didn't have Decision Quest. I didn't have Robert Bennett. And the man that I wanted to use, uh, who was a social psychologist at the University of Kansas, wonderful man, had helped me tremendously, was unavailable because he had started a partnership with two other people who wanted to do jury consulting work in uh, um, 
the largest county in Kansas where Olathe is, about a million population, and they didn't want to be associated with McVeigh case. That's not to be critical of the people that I did use, but Marx, Stan Marx, he was a Florida lawyer. I mean, I had explained to him what snow and ice was. I'm being facetious, but but that he wasn't used to Denver or Colorado. I mean, it was, it was two states dissimilar, Florida and Colorado, certainly among them. And then I had a firm out of New York. Um, they were good, but they didn't have the skill that the others had for this type of case. And Decision Quest had had the Poly Clause case and several others, and they had two psychologists sitting at one of the two government council tables. And it was clear they were running the defense. Um, and the we knew the very first day testimony was offered, and it quickly became obvious what the government would do is each Friday afternoon, the last witness in the government's case was a victim. Very effective. And whenever we scored a point by cross-examination, they would reshuffle and put a victim on next. And I mean, members of the jury would cry when these people were testifying and, and naturally. Um, and there was nothing that I could do. I couldn't stand that and object. Uh, Judge Mitch gave me a continuing objection, fortunately. Um, I, I remember one woman at the end of her testimony. Uh, and of course, I didn't ask her any questions. As she was getting ready to leave the witness stand, she was standing up and she turned to the judge and she said, God bless America. What, what response was there to that? I mean, there's none. Now, FBI witnesses who went through their usual uh, trial techniques of not talking to the lawyers, but turning to the jury. First time one of them did that, I objected and Judge Mach sharply told the witness to quit looking at the jury and face the lawyer asking him the questions. Um, but when they put the victims on, um, that, that was very difficult. And I think that they made that change probably about the time of the Dallas Morning News story, because I think they realized what a gift that was to the government. Um, so all we could do, and Rob and I asked me, well, what are we going to do? And I said, we're going to wait and see if they make a mistake. And they did make a mistake. Uh, that was probably the only time that I really disagreed with Judge Mage. I thought he should have declared a mistrial. He had only had six alternates, and it was obvious that what had happened is the jury as a whole had been infected. And the alternates didn't know they were alternates. In other words, there were 18 of them. So he couldn't even do that, uh, that is, to seat alternates. And so he... Uh, um, he, he not only refused to declare a mistrial, he refused to have a hearing. Um, I understand from the psychology of the judge, and, and certainly uh, I think Judge Mach is the finest federal judge and certainly one of the finest judges that I've ever practiced in front of. I left with unbounded admiration. Um, I thought he was very fair to us, and he was certainly fair to me personally. He, he absolutely protected me physically and our team um, and, and was very respectful of Tim McVeigh. And it's kind of interesting to me, their dynamic. I mean, they each played their respective role of defendant and judge perfectly. Um, that's kind of straying from the, the question you asked me, but that was part of the dynamics that went into it. So we, we also had trouble getting witnesses, particularly expert witnesses. That's why I had to make so many trips out of the country um, because uh, to get bomb trace analysis witnesses, you really have to go either to Israel or the, or the United Kingdom. And we got wonderful witnesses, but um, dry explanations about the elements of chemistry do not equal people who've lost a husband or a wife or a child and who are testifying. S similar to what um, Mr. Tritico said, 
that there was an endless, an endless supply of victims. And every time the momentum shifted, another victim hit the stand was kind of how he yes. put it. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. Let's talk about, uh, you know, separate and apart from all of the other components of this case, cross-examining a, an accomplice. You had the opportunity to do Michael. I mean, obviously you had the opportunity to do Lori. Um, yes. How, how did you prepare for it? And um, what was your major points going into it? And did you score those points? Um, yes and no. Uh, the way we prepared for it, um, we had all of their witness statements, their 302s. And I believe one or both of them may have testified in front of the grand jury. We tried to interview them. They had lawyers appointed. Mac Martin, I think, represented Lori. Mac's a very good criminal defense lawyer. And Lori, of the, of the four named perpetrators, Lori clearly was the smartest of the four there. There wasn't any question about that. And um, she basically threw her husband under the bus. Um, attractive woman. Um, the government put them through uh, their preparation, and when they walked in the courtroom, they were completely different in appearance. I, if they hadn't have said their names were Michael and Lori Fortier, I don't think I would have recognized them. Um, they had been to finishing school. I mean, their clothes, the way they held themselves, their speaking, um, all of that. Uh, at least initially, they were superb witnesses. I had a handicap. Tim McVeigh had had a physical relationship with Lori, and he told me, I do not want you to embarrass Lori Fortier. I mean, I don't think you use the word embarrass, but that's what he, and I said, Tim, I mean, let's get serious here. Um, no, he didn't want to do it. And I, I didn't think he was making a story up. The minute that Lori Fortier walked into the courtroom and the way she looked at Tim McVeigh, I thought, my God, he's right. They, they, they're a couple. And uh, you, the, the, the look on her face simply was, you didn't give me away, did you? So I stayed away from that, which is unfortunate because, of course, that could have been evidence of a motive. But <clears throat> the way I prepared, Rob, Rob and I did the research. He found every statement that they had ever made and then compared it to stories that had appeared in the Arizona Republic, which they took, the newspaper. And our point was, well, the reason you know all of this is because you read it in the newspaper. Uh, of course, Michael and Lori denied ever reading the newspaper, that, you know, which I'm not sure the jury bought that. Um, I, I think that they accepted the credibility of what they were saying even as they saw really who they were. And, and my feelings about Lori are, are particularly strong. In fact, Joe Hartzler and I, and we weren't friends during the trial, but we became friends later. And, and he was ribbing me one time about how would I have felt if I got Tim McVeigh off. And I said, well, partner, uh, the only person I know that got somebody off was you. And he said, "Me? What, what, what the hell did I do? And I said, well, you, how, many, how much time did Lori Fortier spend in jail? I said, clearly she was a conspirator. I mean, you didn't want to call her a conspirator. I understand that. But I mean, this woman knew the time, date, and place of the bombing. And she wrote those statements that, that her husband read to CNN because when you all did the search of their trailer, you found her earlier drafts. And, and she typed uh, the, the card and laminated it. And then when she went out to the motel before Tim came back, she wrapped all of those uh, uh, blasting caps in Christmas paper so that if he was stopped, it would look like Christmas gifts. And I said, and then to top it all off, Joe, she testified, and it's true that one day while Michael was gone from their trailer, was in town, Tim McVeigh got on the floor with her and used soup cans and showed the diagram of the bomb. I said, Joe, what do you think Lori Fortier and Tim McVeigh were doing on the floor of her apartment at three o'clock in the afternoon while her husband was gone? I mean, let's get serious here. Um, all she had to do was pick up the phone and call and say, hey, 
such and such. I mean, other people that figured out without having direct knowledge that Tim McVeigh was involved, that fellow in Buffalo, he was on the phone within 12 hours to the FBI. Um, but by the time the government made Lori over, she could have qualified for Vanity Fair. Um, so I don't think the cross, Michael was not that effective a witness, but Lori was, I think, mainly because I couldn't, because Tim didn't want me to, go into the dynamics of the three of them. Um, so, uh, I, I mean, on balance, the, the jury had to believe them, maybe begrudgingly, but they had to believe them. Michael Fortier uh, got, what, 23 years? Well, no, he got 12 years, I think. That was the, the I'm sorry, you're right. The, when, the, when the trial happened, it was, you know, you're looking at up to 23 years, but the deal is going to be finalized after the trial. This is the sort of Damocles, I think is, is how you referred to yes. it. Yeah. But he only, that was, first of all, he only got 12 years for all that. That's correct. Okay. Um, the Bridges calling card. Okay. This, uh, this calling card, the spotlight calling card, the Bridges calling card that was used ostensibly by, by Tim and I guess Terry Nichols, they were sort of calling in on the same code from different places. How, how important was that to, to knock out from the defense standpoint? How important was that to the government's case? I guess is another way. It was, it was important that the, the Bridges, Daryl Bridges debit credit card or debit card, which they would gotten from, um, uh, I forgot now it's a extreme right wing, perhaps even anti-Semitic organization. They were able to tile those calls in to places that you'd be calling if you were interested in building explosives. We, at that time, that concept of debit cards and cell phones was fairly new. And so it was difficult to find experts, but uh, to see us through the maze and the telephone technology of how the Bureau could trace calls was phenomenal. I didn't realize that it had um, advanced to that stage. Um, I always felt that the debit card was in many respects, the key to unraveling the mystery. There were three or four things about it that, um, and the technique of how to use it and hide it was clearly developed. It had to be developed by people smarter than Tim McVeigh and Terry Nichols. But even if I'm wrong about that, it was clear that there were calls placed on that card by people other than Tim and Terry, which to me was the unexplained mystery of the card. I, I, I clearly Marifay Nichols used it. Um, but I remember that Several years after the case was over, the BBC contacted me from London and they flew a team, uh, presumably from their New York office to Enid. And they had uh, what I thought was an amazing revelation. They had the Daryl Bridges debit card and they had found the card that we thought the call that was so unusual, which was to the owner of the boarding house who lived in an apartment in Queens. And there had been a call to him at a time that neither Terry nor uh, Tim had made that call. What the BBC brought to me was phone records of Ramsey Yosef, which I'd never seen before and were much in the same format as the Daryl Bridges debit card. And the BBC had traced down that Ramsey Yosef or uh, his uh, Haka Marad had called an apartment in the same building three years early in the apartment directly above the apartment where our call was made. And their point was, what do you think of the statistical odds that two terrorists would call the same building in Queens, New York, one floor separating one apartment from the other? And what are the statistical odds of that? And I, I thought that was a very telling uh, and incriminating piece of evidence that um, 
the information we had about Terry Nichols' trips to the Philippines, I never accepted for one moment his explanation. I thought uh, it was a cover for something else. And, and there were other pieces of evidence. And, and I finally concluded that my original assumption that James Nichols was the mastermind was wrong, that Terry Nichols was the mastermind. Uh, and, and Tim McVeigh told me, and I credited him, and I couldn't always credit him, but he told me, he said, he had no idea what Terry Nichols had done in the Philippines. And I said, well, I, I think that's right. I think you're leveling with me. You don't know what he did. All I can tell you is that you were never able to build a bomb until Terry Nichols got back from the Philippines. And the first time he got back, you were able to explode one and blow up a fairly large rock in the desert. Um, so I, I, I think Terry was up to some mischief in the Philippines. He, he was, um, he was a work of art. Uh, so, so do you think that, uh, I guess the way that it, that it read from the transcript was that uh, McVeigh had ordered this Ragnar's book of, of explosives, you know, and uh, him and Michael and Lori had gone yep. out and they had tried to blow some stuff up. You're, is, do you think that his knowledge of how to actually use something like that didn't come from, from, from that trial and error in that book, but rather from Terry? That's my belief. Um, the, the, and, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I think the government proved the case they could prove. And there are other leads, they just simply couldn't develop them because they didn't have that kind of informants. They couldn't maintain that type of surveillance, electronic surveillance, which they did on McVeigh's sister and mother. Um, they had some informants, but uh, it was a pretty closed net of circle at that time. Um, I thought um, in, in some respects, Tim was almost an innocent in the sense that his views were pretty cut and dried. You could see how he might have had a failure of critical faculties. But um, one time Mike Tiger and I got into a, sort of a heated argument and Mike was telling me something, and, and I, I told him, I said, Mike, I understand that you've got to put the blame on my client for your defense. But I said, when your client was confronting that judge in Michigan, and it was tape recorded and threatening him, my client was in the eighth grade. And I don't know anybody that says Tim McVeigh was a terrorist in the eighth grade. But all you have to do is listen to that conversation, and a chill runs down your spine. And I'll bet you after that day, the judge took the necessary steps to protect himself. It was some ordinary civil case, and we'd gotten the tape because they didn't have a court reporter. They taped all the things. And, and it was a pretty threatening conversation. Um, I think McVeigh was, um, was used by the Nichols and, and maybe others, but clearly by them. Uh, I think James knew what was going on but he took a step back. But Terry, um, the, the, I don't want to be critical of the government, but yet they didn't find those 4,000 blasting caps in his basement, even though they had this massive search warrant. And they didn't find those 4,000 documents they were supposed to give to us. So even assuming that they acted in good faith, and I got to know those men and women pretty well, um, I think they followed the lead that would get them what they wanted, which was a conviction. And if they couldn't prove it up on other people, you know, they indicted James, but dismissed it. And so we were left. Um, so. Tim McVeigh didn't testify. I, he did I, not. I would have thought he would have in some respects. I mean, it seems like this is, um, something that he wanted to, I don't know, if this was a wake-up call for the government, if this was, if you if you believe the motive that was offered, this was a wake-up call and he should have been the one to do it. I think, you know, there was talk about a necessity defense and he, even in your book, you talked about that, but he didn't, he didn't testify. Did y'all talk about that? How come he didn't testify? Well, we did, but in a different vein. I seriously considered 
calling him as a witness and cross-examining him. And um, exposing the distortions and lies in his created explanation of how he himself was responsible. And th this was the central um, conflict in the defense. Um, I had a, an assistant named Ann Bradley, who was um, probably about 30. She later went to Georgetown Law School. And she had helped me with various writing projects. And, and I asked her to come as my assistant. Uh, Anne has uh, not only attractive, she has a Lauren Bacall type personality. And she's very good at analyzing people. And finally, when I could not get to what the truth was, I thought, well, at least I might be able to figure out what the truth isn't. And so using the techniques, uh, I was an English major of the new criticism, which I had been exposed to at the University of Texas, I asked her to take all of our notes of interviews and transcripts with Tim McVeigh, which is probably six inches high. And I asked her to go through that and using just close attention to the words, what, what was actually said to tell me if his story held. I said, forget everything else you know about the Oklahoma City bombing. Just concentrate on what McVeigh says. And, uh, and then give me your analysis of his personality. Now, she wasn't a psychiatrist or um, psychologist. She was an art major as an undergraduate and then later went to law school. She came back and gave me two memos, 16 pages long, as I recall, blue paper, small pica or elite, whatever the smallest type is. And I read those and I thought, my God, this is it. This is it. She went through all of his stories and elaborations and the question was, is he lying to us? And she said, why would we even ask this question when he has lied to us from day one? We can hardly accept the validity of anything he's told us because we've been able to disprove it. But here's what's still remaining. And so then she analyzes and she comes, she builds to the conclusion and she says, if Tim McVeigh is telling us the truth, then the following people saw him. And she lists 10 people. And I thought, well, that's right. I mean, they would have seen him. Where are these 10 people? So the next day I went out to see Tim and I confronted him and we had a, and I, I, he said, I don't understand why you don't believe me. And I said, well, come on now, seriously, you can't maintain that. No, I really don't understand. I've been truthful with you and bullshit. And I said, Tim, to believe you, I have to believe that three young men had a chance to get $2 million and turned it down. Walked away from it. And he said, what three young men? And so I told him. And I could tell by his facial expression as I recited that I had hit a home run. And for the first time in the two years we had known each other, he was quiet. It, it seemed like five minutes. I'm sure it was only a minute. And he, he looked out the window and he was thinking and he turned back to me and he said, how would the truth help me? And I gave him the wrong answer. I said, Tim, I don't know they would. It's not the answer I should have given him, but I should have told him. Um, was Tim, well, there are two buildings that are important in my life. One is the administration building at the University of Texas. And the second is the original building for the CIA in McLean, Virginia. And above the entrance to both of those buildings is the same wording from the gospel according to St. John. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. That's what I should have told him. And I think that might have led someplace. And when I gave him the answer that I did, he said, I had nothing further to say. I said, well, I won't mention it again. And as I got ready to leave, that's when he asked me if I really believed that Terry had gone to the Philippines to learn how to build a bomb. And I said, well, Tim, considering that you were willing to drive from the California-Arizona border 
to Harrisonburg, Virginia to buy a piece of debt cord that you could have bought at the hardware store that you worked in, in Kingman. Now that's a distance of what, 20, 2,700 miles? You were willing to travel that to get a piece of debt cord? I don't have any trouble believing Terry Nichols would travel 11,000 miles to figure out how to build a bomb. And that's when he said, I don't know anything about what Terry Nichols did in the Philippines. And I said, well, I believe you're telling me the truth about that. So uh, our defense, the only one we could have that was legitimate was you've indicted him, now prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, and uh, that was what we built it on. I think we might have had some luck in some way. Um, the, the, had we not had the, the Dallas Morning News and ABC Playboy disclosures. And the other thing that's not generally known is um, there was an important decision in the death penalty phase that we had to make. Uh, I did not think, in fact, was very skeptical and critical of using the typical death penalty mitigation. I said, well, first of all, the way to defeat the death penalty is to prevent him from being convicted of something that carries the death penalty. That's the first goal. If we're not succeeding there, then clearly the odds are against us. So we developed two theories. Uh, and Judge Mage funded one of them. We wanted to say to the jury, okay, you found Tim McVeigh guilty. You said it was because of Waco. So let's show you what the government did at Waco. And we probably spent a million dollars investigating Waco. And I was very confident of some of the material that we had. The other, which the Holy See and the Vatican had assisted us with in, in very dramatic but un, unstated ways, uh, which we arranged through a Polish diplomat that I knew uh, when I went to Syria to meet him, was um, in the discussions that we had, Dick thought we should have Archbishop Tutu come to Denver to testify. And I said, Dick, Archbishop Tutu is a political figure now, and he's not going to come to Denver to help us. I suggest we go where we have natural allies. And um, he said, well, where is that? And I said, the Holy See. The most popular man in the world, the most inspirational is John Paul II. And um, Dick kind of scuffed at that. It was a serious conversation we had late one fall evening. And I said, Dick, uh, the problem is you're a secular humanist. So you see the Pope as sort of this uh, old man who's against intermarriage of gays and who doesn't want priests to marry and is against abortion. And you, you think he's Bishop of Rome or something like that. And I said, but for a billion people, which incidentally is the majority or certainly the plurality in the federal district of Colorado, the Pope is the successor to St. Peter. He stands in the shoes of the apostle. He holds the keys to the kingdom of heaven as the power to forgive sins when matters, speaking on matters of church dogma and morals, his judgment is said to be infallible. He's not just the Bishop of Rome or the Patriarch of uh, the West or the Patriarch of Italy or the Primate of the West. He's the servant of the servants of God. And he's opposed to the death penalty. So why don't we see what we can do there? I mean, that's a natural for us. And um, to me, the most dramatic moment in many ways was the Sunday after the second anniversary on Saturday, every church bell in Denver, and even those that were recorded rang 168 times. I remember sitting in my apartment and marking them off with a pencil and stick numbers, one, two, three, four, five, till 168. The next day, Sunday, at about two o'clock, Kevin Flynn, who was the Rocky Mountain News, called me and he said, uh, Mr. Jones, I wanted to get your reaction to uh, uh, Archbishop uh, Chaput, I think his name, uh, or, uh, homily this morning. I said, I'm not familiar. 
with the Archbishop's homily. And he said, well, I'll read it to you. He, he delivered this from the pulpit at, I've forgotten the name of the cathedral, but it's the same pulpit that John Paul II spoke from when he came to Denver three years before for World Youth Day. And he had directed it be read from every pulpit at the 11 o'clock mass in the Archdiocese of Denver. And he said, we're leading with the story that the Archbishop said that the imposition of the death penalty by the state in all circumstances is contrary to the teachings of Jesus Christ and his church who taught us that mercy is a greater virtue than justice. And I thought, wow, what a powerful statement. Um, so when I went to Tim planning the second stage, I said, you know, there's two ways we can go here. There's what I would like call the John Brown theory. And then this other theory, which I explained to him and Tim was a Catholic. He said, and when I said mercy is a greater virtue than justice, he said, but I don't believe that. He said, I want to go with the John Brown. I said, are you sure? That's an important decision. He said, yes, that's what I want to do. So Judge Mates restricted us. We couldn't prove what the government did. We could only prove what McVeigh's perception was. And I thought, well, you play poker with the hand you're dealt. So we almost broke through. The government put, um, or we put... Uh, witness on the stand, Dick Revis, I think. And Pat Ryan, who was Catholic, who was the United States attorney, very fine lawyer, very good lawyer. He started cross-examining Dick. Dick had written a book called Ashes of Waco. And he went way too far. And he was opening the door. I mean, the door was swinging open for us. And of course, I didn't object to a single question. So at the end of the day, and I could tell Judge Mage was getting very nervous. So at the end of the day, uh, I said, Your Honor, may we approach the bench? And uh, he said, yes. So Larry Mackey walked up for the government. And the judge, I said, Your Honor, I believe uh, Mr. Ryan has opened the door. And we're entitled to show what the government did. And I was right. I mean, I, absolutely, I was right. And, and uh, the judge looked at Larry and he said, Mr. Mackey, when are you going to finish the cross-examination the cross of Mr. Revis? Or when will Mr. Ryan finish? He said, You're fi he's finished, Your Honor. We don't have any other questions. And the judge looked at me and said, your motion is overruled. And um, I mean, even the government knew that Ryan had swung that door open. Um, and not to beleaguer the time, but the, the, the real defense that was built was the idea that there was a leg that was unidentified. P-71. P-71. It was originally, I think, P-54. Uh, Lakeisha Levy's leg. And uh, I was pretty confident that Lakeisha Levy, the leg there was um, not hers. And when we all went down for the exhumation in the surgical theater and they opened the casket and took the metals out, her body had been terribly disrupted. And um, they did the examination and the B54 or 51 matched up with her DNA but then the medical examiner brought out another severed left leg. And that became, and, and as you may know, uh, we brought over TK Marshall, Sir TK Marshall, and Dr. Um, Jordan, the medical examiner. Tom, I mean, uh, Pat cross uh, or directed his examination, but he didn't let the doctor tell a story about how they had meticulously identified. And that was a mistake because Jordan had a wonderful story to tell. So I let him tell that story for about 
hour and a half and I led to the conclusion. I said, doctor, how many, uh, um, let's see, how was it put? How many traumatically amputated left legs did you have? He said nine. And I said, and how many victims had traumatically amputated left legs? He said eight. And I said, what's your medical conclusion? He said, we have an unidentified body somewhere. There are nine victims. Well, of course, our theory was the ninth victim was the bomb. And that theory had been developed by Dr. Marshall, Sir Marshall, Sir T.K., was the retired chief state pathologist for Northern Ireland who had performed over 3,000 autopsies on ammonia nitrate bombing victims. And he gave very graphic and very professional and cordial testimony about how that could happen and experience ahead in Northern Ireland. And that was the day I think that we scored the best. That ended up getting us uh, my picture with Dr. Marshall on the front page of the New York Times. So yeah. and I think what the headline defense asserts, real bomber died in bombing. Well, you had- That was our high water point, that and the severance. My, my favorite part, my favorite line in your whole trial from your transcript was when you, uh, you asked him and you said, and as a physician, you know, there's no human being with two left feet except for when dancing. <laughs> well, Pat Ryan, yeah, I, I'd forgotten that, uh, but Pat Ryan really, he said, well, doctor, isn't it possible that you buried someone with two right legs? <laughs> and he said, no, Mr. Ryan, that's not possible. There's a clear anatomical difference between a left leg and a right leg, which any second week, first year medical student knows. And I thought... I wasn't much of a fan of Dr. Jordan, except on that day. Um, but um, in the end, it didn't help us. Well, well I, and I got to ask you, okay, you know, just to follow up on this, and then I'll let you go. I've, I've kept you longer than I said. But, but, you know, what did McVeigh say about this left leg? I mean, it seems to me that if, if your point was that there was another person that was involved, this is the best piece of evidence that you have to prove that. I mean, you know, but what was McVeigh's take on it? Ann Bradley's conclusion, which is in the second to last paragraph of her memorandum, is, and I can almost quote it exactly, she said, uh, Tim McVeigh is a walking dead man. Everyone has betrayed him, his family, his uh, buddies, and then she lists these people. Um, and he wants to be remembered as the mastermind. And if you're the chump that got caught, how do you want to go out as the mule or the mastermind? And so therefore he doesn't buy our defense that there were others. That's where we're in conflict with him. He wants you to get him off, but only on his terms. And he will sacrifice himself before he betrays the others. And he did. And he did sacrifice himself. I mean, we were satisfied. When we left, we thought we could almost identify them. And then uh, through the work of Mark Ham and um, John Solomon, the Associated Press, and Stuart Wright's book, Politics, Patriots in the Oklahoma City Bombing, I think they closed the circle on who the others were. But of course, at that time, the public's mind had moved on to other things. It was 9-11 and um, the public, uh, the, the support for the death penalty, according to the polls, was the highest it had ever been in recorded polling history on the day McVeigh received the death penalty. Um, myself, I think there were others. Well, I'm positive there were others. And I think it's fairly ascertainable who they are. Um, but the government couldn't prove. And I understand that they didn't have an informant. They didn't have wiretapping. Um, they had surveillance, but only from a distance and only from satellites uh, and drones. And that didn't read people's minds or conversations inside buildings. So it didn't go anywhere. Well, Mr. Jones, thank you very much for talking with me. Um, is there anything else that, that you want to pass along or anything else that you want to share that you wish I would have asked about before I let you go? No, I, I will tell you that, that in my 
I had two goals. I told Judge Russell that I would not defend him with one arm tied behind my back. And that in my own way was that I would not let his life or liberty or reputation or property be taken except by due process of law. And I think that accounts for the rather vigorous defense that we maintained. And, and some people at times didn't understand what we were doing, but I understood it and I knew why we were doing it. And um, the second objective, I, I wanted to try to be as professional as I could and yet not have any physical safety issues so that in some other case where a lawyer was called to defend someone that was extremely hated or unpopular, they would not fear for their safety. If I could survive, they could survive. And so um, it was important to me that I conduct myself appropriately and professionally and that I survived it. And I had survived it. Um, it wasn't always easy, but I didn't expect it to always be easy. So. I wasn't disappointed. And, and frankly, I, I give a lot of that credit to Judge Mage. I am very grateful to Mr. Jones for sharing his thoughts on the case with us. Visit amurderousdesign.com for links to his book and articles he wrote about the unalterable duty of the criminal defense attorney. On the next episode, we'll sit down with the self-described lunch bucket lawyer from Indiana, lead prosecutor Larry Mackey. Thank you very much for joining me. I'm Brandon Birmingham. This is Timothy McVeigh versus the USA. Mm.